Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Jacob and welcome to the fifth video in the Blockchain in Rust video series. This is the second video about transactions in which we'll be going over the actual implementation and the code of the concepts we talked about in the first video. So let's get started with iterators. So in JavaScript or languages like it, you'll probably be familiar with how arrays it, with arrays and stuff, you can you can loop over them using functions like map or or filter or something like that, and it kind of um, allows you to like functionally declare exactly the operations that you're performing on the sequence of data in a very concise way. Rust iterators are actually really powerful in my opinion. I really like them, how they've been implemented. And you have all these familiar functions like map, flat map, filter, for each, any, all, etc., etc. And uh, one of the ones I really like that we will be using in this video is called collect. So imagine you have a vector of the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You create the iterator by saying like my vector dot iter on it and then you can use all these functions like maybe you want to filter out all the odd numbers so you only have the even ones left and then you want to map each of those to its its square and then uh you want to uh and then you want to collect them all into maybe a a hash set or something like that then you would use the collect function and you give it whatever type in these uh in the angle brackets here and it will convert that iterator, that sequence of data into whatever other data structure you want to. Uh, uh, there's a limit, whatever type this B is, it has to support it. But I mean, whatever you would expect to support it, like a vector, a hash set, a hash map, a string, whatever, at least in the standard library, they do support this collect function. So it's really great, it's really powerful, I love it. Um, so yeah, let's go over to the editor and implement our transaction and output structs like we described them in the last video. So I'm going to create a new file here. We'll call it transaction action.rs and I should be able to type properly. Um, so we'll create our public struct transaction. And inside of here, we'll just have inputs and outputs. If you remember from the last video, inputs are literally it's just going to be a list of outputs and we'll create that struct in just a sec pub outputs is the same out outputs is the same thing it's a vector of out outputs wow i'm making all kinds of typos today outputs okay so we'll create pub struct output there i typed it correctly um, and then in here, we'll just have two fields again. It'll be a two address, which will be an address. We'll define that in just a sec. And a value, which will be a unsigned, can't type, 64-bit uh, integer. So yeah, let's add this to our library file real quick. Say mod transaction, and then Pub use create transaction tra transaction cool all right so, oh and we have to define what address is I'm literally going to define another type alias called hash and that will be a string and by now we should update this guy so it's just a hash actually can I rename that hash yeah cool Oh, whoops. Whoops, what did I do? Okay. So, I messed that up. Okay, that type. Ha, huh. address. String, okay. Is that still down there? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now let's, uh, great. Okay. So this is saved. Did that change everything to be called hash? Yeah, it kind of did. Oh, well then I guess I can just do that. 
and that should leave things in a mostly functional state. And I want to change this to hash as well, which means up here we have to use super. But those are just some code cleanup things. I don't really have to worry about. This guy needs to use super as well to get that address alias. It'll just be a string. We can change it later. Um, but it's a string so that it's simple for us to look at in the code for now. All right, now uh, both of these need to be hashable. So we'll implement our hashable trait uh, for output. And we here's our bytes function, self. And that returns a vector of bytes. So we'll say let mut bytes equal vector, there's our vector generator thingy, and we can say bytes dot extend, we'll say uh, the address first, so we'll say self dot dot to address as as bytes. Okay, and then we'll say bytes dot extend uh, u64 bytes uh, self dot value Cool. and then bytes. Okay, so there's our implementation of the hashable trait for our outputs. And we'll do the same or similar thing for transactions. Hashable for trans ac 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 eh, transaction. Sometimes autocomplete doesn't show up when you need it. Um, bytes. And then we'll take self and return a vector of bytes. Cool, let mut bytes equal a vector like that. And now we can use some of our nifty new iterator uh, functions that we just learned about. So we'll say bytes.extend. And now in here, I'm gonna say self dot inputs dot, actually I'll put it over here. So it'll be nice and spacey dot iter to create the iterator. So now we can use some of those nifty functions. I'm gonna say dot flat map. I'll explain that in just a sec. Uh, flat map input. So loop through each of these. I'll take an input. Oh, okay. Back up just a sec. So flat map, it takes a lambda function, which in JavaScript would look something like this. It's like you're creating a anonymous function that does something really quick, right? It looks like that. And you say return, whatever, whatever. It works or it looks different in Rust you have these vertical bars and inside of well so you have two of them and inside of these is where you define your like your parameter list right so this will take an input okay and it will return uh, input dot bytes okay and now we can uh, say collect that's a nifty collect function into a vector of unsigned uh, eight bit integers, which are bytes. Okay, so what exactly is this line doing right here? Let me get rid of these errors so that the RLS is happy with me. Okay, so this, you're probably familiar with this. This would take um, an input and literally replace its spot in the iterator with this. It's, it's array of bytes. But the problem is we don't want, well, it's a vector. We don't want a vector of vectors of bytes. We want just a vector of bytes. We want them all flattened, you know, squished together end to end to end. And that is actually what this uh, flat map function does for us. It says, okay, so I'm going through an iterator, but what this lambda function is going to return to me is also going to be an iterator and I don't want to make that iterator an item of the iterator I'm outputting I want to put every item in that iterator in the iterate put every it's it's like you're just appending these iterators together instead of making the iterator that's returned an item of the iterator that you're returning that that sounds confusing even as I'm saying it it's very similar to map. Hopefully, hopefully you get this. Um, it map would give us a vector of vectors of bytes. This 
flattens those vectors, just appends them all together. That's the, that's the simple explanation. Okay, and then we can do the same thing for outputs. Out, outputs, output, and output. Okay, beautiful. So we've written, uh, both of these are now hashable, and we're just gonna write a couple helper functions for our transaction struct. So we'll write our, in jeepers, I really can't type today. Okay, implement, implementation bl block for train, trans action. Oh, okay, public function. Um, we're gonna make ones that sum up all of the uh, the values of the input and respectively the outputs. Um, all of those inputs and outputs will sum up all their values. So input value, input value, that'll take self, and return, return a unsigned 64-bit integer. So here we will say self.inputs, and then we'll create another iterator, and we'll map each of the inputs to its input value, and then we can sum them all up. Now that is nice, that it just has a sum function built in. Yep, works just fine. Rust is totally happy. Okay, then we'll create one for output values. Outputs, output, and output. Okay, that'll work. Sweet. Now, um, we're going to create two functions that return the uh, list of hash, well, not a list, a set of hashes, a set of hashes that uh, correspond to the inputs and the outputs. So I'm going to say public function input hashes self and then we'll return a hash set of hashes and we'll have to import hash set. So that's part of the standard library luckily. Use standard library collections hash set. Okay, cool. Come back down here and we can say uh, self self inputs iterate create the iterator and then map each of the inputs to input hash and then collect into hash set of hashes like so and that'll automatically return whoopsies Okay, dang it. Okay, sometimes my undo stack gets really messed up with this Vim plugin. Okay, sorry about that. So say output hashes, and then out outputs, output and output dot hash, and then one last function is. Coinbase. Okay, so what this function will do, it'll basically be one super, super basic check for now. Um, but it'll basically, the point of it is to say this transaction would only make sense as a Coinbase transaction, and obviously it would be invalid otherwise. So right now, our only check is going to be um, is going to be self dot inputs dot length is equal to zero. That's our only check right now. Obviously, there can be other criteria, but that's the only one we're going to care about for now. And there we go. That is just about everything we're going to have to do in this file for now for this video. Okay, so let's go on and talk a little bit about errors in Rust. So if you're familiar with a language like Java, you're familiar with the concept of, you know, try catch blocks and exceptions. Rust doesn't have that exception data type exactly, not like the throw catchable dealio. Um, instead, you just have this standard library provided uh, struct or en enum um, called result. And that will either take the form of result okay or result error. 
and you just have to figure out, okay, is the result of this function, did it execute okay, or was it an error? And those that struct is representing uh, only errors that you can recover from. But if it's an unrecoverable error, for some reason, Rust will instead panic. And panic is a macro, which is why I put an exclamation point uh, here, because macros end in exclamation points in Rust. Um, so you can either have recoverable errors with re result or unrecoverable errors with panic. Um, you don't want to panic very often uh, because then your program will entirely stop and Rust will just try to recover before it quits entirely. Um, it's pretty much like your program just like crashed. So we want to use results instead of panics. Great, so we got errors out of the way. And now let's talk a little bit about null, which doesn't really exactly exist in Rust. Instead, we have this other enum called option, and options can be either some or none. Some would have a value attached to it, obviously, and none doesn't. This is typically the closest you'll get to actually seeing null in a Rust program. Typically, you know, it, Rust just encourages you not to have null floating around, which in general is a good idea. So you don't you don't, uh, yeah, using, it can be dangerous as you're probably familiar with if you used a language like Java, you have null pointer exceptions and those are just the worst. But Rust conveniently gets rid of null because turns out you don't always need it. Okay, so we're gonna use those two slides of information uh, to help update our blockchain now. So we have this verify function in the code right now, but we're going to change that to be a update the blockchain with this block function and that will verify the block ensure it can be added and then it will add it to the blockchain if it can't and if it can't it will return an error so we'll be returning a result type here um, but now that we have transactions in our blocks we're going to have to be maintaining this list of unspent outputs for now it'll be a hash set of just the hashes of the outputs with our current implementation of outputs right now that only keep track of values and addresses that the output was sent to, this will make uh, every output that is sent to one address with a particular value look the exact same. This will change very soon, hopefully, um, probably by the time we talk about smart contracts in one of the videos coming soon. Um, but basically we have to answer three new questions uh, from our old validate function. Can we spend the input? Um, that will be like has, uh, basically do all the inputs in this transaction exist in the unspent outputs pool? How many coins are in the output? We can just check the values using those convenient uh, transaction value functions that we just wrote. And then is the Coinbase transaction valid? which for now is not going to be a very stringent check, but we'll still add it just for the just for the sake of it. Okay, so let's jump back over to the code and do some of that validation. So this is going to be in our blockchain.rs file. We have this verify function, which I'm going to change to be a update, update with block function. Okay, so that will actually mutate this self and it will take a block, which is a block, Surprise, surprise. Okay, so we'll delete this guy and dedent all of this code, uh, get rid of this guy, this guy, this guy, and we're returning a result, which will actually have nothing as its okay uh, type. Empty parentheses are just like, kind of like nothing. It's like null, except not, because you can't really use this for anything. It literally means empty will never mean anything. Um, but here, we're going to put our error type, which we haven't created yet, but we will right now. So this is going to be like a poor man's version of an of a custom error implementation in Rust. We're not really going to add anything nice to it that makes it actually super useful as an error type. For now, it'll basically just be so we can differentiate between the errors. Um, 
So we have a couple basic types of errors. You know, uh, and I'm going to call this a block validation error enum. Sweet. So we'll have mismatched indices. We will have an invalid hash. That'll be in the case when uh, it doesn't match the difficulty. We will have a chronological timestamp, chronological timestamps. We will have a mismatched previous hash. We'll have invalid genesis block format. For, oh gosh, block format and invalid input, insufficient input value, and invalid Coinbase tra transaction. OK. So those are error types, are possible different types of errors, and block validation error will be the error type here. And say i is now going to be self.blocks.length because it'll be the last one we're adding to the end of our blockchain. So i should be okay here. Dun, 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 dun. Sweet. And we're going to replace all of these guys, the print lines, and return false or true. Whoops. Uh, with return error. And this will be block validation error. And this one was uh, mismatched index. Oops. OK, now this one, difficulty fail, return error, um, block validation error, invalid hash. OK, for these that are not Genesis blocks, this is an A chronological timestamp. Return error, block block validation error, a chronological timestamp. This is a hash, hash mismatch for uh, previous hashes. So mismatched previous hash. Return error, block validation error, m mismatched previous hash. Cool. OK, and then finally for our Genesis block, return error, block validation error, invalid Genesis block format. OK, cool. And then down here, we'll return OK with nothing. Sweet. So we have successfully uh, translated this over to our new error function dealio format. And now we can check the transactions, check what's actually going on. So uh, check what's going on inside. And we have to maintain this uh, pool of unspent transactions. I'm going to attach that directly to the blockchain uh, blockchain struct here. It will represent the current state of the unspent outputs. I say unspent transactions. I meant unspent outputs. Um, so I'll say unspent outputs, outputs. It will represent the current state based on everything that's happened after the last block. Uh, or until the last block, it won't be like, here's the history of all the different outputs that have been unspent. We can calculate that based on the blocks in our blockchain. So we only have to keep track of the latest one for when we want to add new blocks to the blockchain. So this will be a hash set of hashes. So we need to import hash set again up here. So use collections hash set. Cool. And then now we can access this pool of unspent outputs. And we want to be able to update that. So we'll keep track of what has been uh, spent and what has been created in here. So I'll say let mutt, um, let mutt block spent equals hash set new. OK. Um, we have to actually get at these transactions first. So I'm going to say if let sum Coinbase transactions equals block.transactions.split first. OK, 
Okay. What the heck is this line doing? If let is a Rust construct that pretty much, oops, that pretty much allows us to destructure a value conditionally. No, um, all right, we have to rename payloads uh, to transactions. We'll do that in just a sec. This will be a vector of transactions uh, when we go and fix that in just a sec. Um, but if let will conditionally destructure uh, and split first is something you can call on a vector to get the first element individually right here and then all the rest over here. And this will return an option, either sum or none. It'll be sum if there is at least one element in the vector, and that would pop into this guy. Otherwise, it'll be none, and then this won't match. And so nothing inside this block would run in the first place. These won't be destructured, because it'll just be none. Um, so we'll first, let's go over to our block file and rename our payload to transactions and actually start using that. So transactions. I can do this, can't I? Transactions. Just kidding, can't. Okay. Transactions. And that will be a vector of transactions. Like so. Probably better that I go through this anyways. Uh, transactions dot length. We'll just output that for now because we don't want to output. We don't want to write an entire debug formatter for our tran each transaction. Nah. Okay, so then this will be transactions. This guy will be transactions, which will be a vector vector of transactions. And we can probably remove nonce from here now. Don't need that. Nonce can just start out as nothing because when we mine it, we go start from zero anyways. Okay, then here, transactions. And oh, that's right. We can use our nice iterator stuff here, dot iterator, and then flat map again. Um, remember flat map, it converts like an array of, or a, a vector of vectors to just a vector by appending them all together. So we'll have transaction, transaction bytes, collect to a vector of unsigned of of bytes basically okay is it happy with that yep yeah, looks like it's happy with that okay so now we can come over here remember if let conditionally destructure so we have our first transaction which should be the coinbase and then the rest of our transactions so we can check this coinbase transaction right off the start to see that it actually fits the format that a trans that a coinbase transaction coinbase uh transaction should fit so if coinbase dot is coinbase not then return error error block validation error invalid coinbase transaction sweet look we're already adding cool new checks okay what is it wrong what is it? oh right block spent is a hash set of hashes Okay, and uh, now let's go through here and and uh, compare it, compare each transaction with unspent outputs pool. So for transaction in transactions, um, let input hashes equal block. Do, oh wait, not block. Haha. Uh -huh. Transaction dot input hashes. That function is coming in handy. Okay, so we have this input hashes set, and we have an uh, unspent output, an unspent outputs set, and we just want to make sure that every single uh, hash in this input hashes set is also in the unspent output unspent outputs hash set 
So luckily we have some operator overloads here that will do us some great, a great deal of good. Um, very helpful. So inside this condition, we're going to say if input hashes minus everything that's in our uns unspent outputs is empty, empty. E. So if, um, so this is going to say if it is empty, that means that every single one of these guys was found in here and was removed. Um, so we want to say not. Then we can come over here and say return error, block validation error, invalid input, because there's at least one input that is not in uh, the unspent outputs. This is not necessarily the most efficient way to do it, but I find it easy to read. And this project is not all about efficiency. It's all about learning. Um, so the problem with this guy is it's only going, it's not going to prevent you from using the same output as an input twice in the same block. So that's why we have this guy here, block spent hash uh, inputs. So or, now let's see what happens uh, if we have even one in common with our block spent. So I'm going to say input hashes ampersand, that's like a bitwise and, so take everything that's in common. And like I said, this is not the most efficient way. I just find it easier to read and we're more concerned about the concepts here than efficiency. So, and uh, block spent is empty. We want it to be empty. So if it isn't empty as well, we'll also check these guys here. Okay. Um, well, well, we'll also perform the check and then return the error if there's any of those that are in common. Sweet. Now let's check the values. Make sure we're not trying to, you know, input a dollar and output seven thousand dollars. So coins, not dollars. Um, let input value equal transaction. Transaction dot input value, and then similar deal for output value output value. If output value is greater than input value, then we can say uh, return error block validation error uh, insufficient input value. Cool. And now we can calculate the fee. Uh, remember that the difference between the input and output values will be the minor fee. Uh, so we'll just say let fee equal input value minus minus output out out put value and uh, we'll keep a running tally of the fee so let mut total fee equal zero okay let fee uh, total fee equals uh, plus equals fee okay um that looks good. And now uh, we want to add all of the spent hashes here. Block spent extend with input hashes, hashes. Actually, I'm going to put all of this code down here. That's just kind of like the finalize code. Um, cool. Then we're also going to want to keep track of the ones that are created. That's good, 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 good. Block created. Uh, trans action output hashes. Okay, sweet. Um, now we can do a little bit more validation on our Coinbase transaction. And we'll just say if Coinbase dot output total uh, value is less than total fee. We'll just call that an error. In reality, we do more validation here. Make sure that the Coinbase transaction is generating the right amount plus the total fee, etc., etc. Um, 
but for now this is the only check we're going to do return error block validation error invalid coinbase transaction lovely okay so we have done all that now we need to update this unspent outputs pool so we have the ones that we have spent so we'll say um, self dot unspent outputs dot retain this is going to be another lambda function so remember parameters between the vertical bars um, output and so long as it is not inside of our ones that have been spent so not block spent contains output that's good so that'll remove all the ones that have been spent self unspent outputs uh, extend with uh, block created oh and then we also need to update block created with the ones that were created in the coinbase transaction so we'll say um, block block created extend with coin coinbase dot uh, output hashes okay sweet and now we've passed all the tests we've updated the unspent outputs uh, we've updated the unspent outputs pool we'll collapse the sky and now we can finally add our block to our blockchain so we'll say self dot blocks dot push block and there we go that should be done sweet now I actually made a slide about writing a working example because it is going to be a little bit more complicated than the videos that we've that uh, I've done before they've been kind of straightforward examples this one is going to be a little bit whoops this one's going to be a little bit more complicated so writing a working example we're going to create our blockchain we'll create our genesis block with a single coinbase transaction and we'll send some coins to different people i'll use the example that we've used in the previous video about uh, alice and bob and then we'll mine that block add it to our blockchain it'll be our genesis block first one cool now this is the fun part or the interesting part um, we'll create another block with more transactions that are either coinbase transactions or the inputs have to reference transactions that have occurred in the genesis block in that previous block there so we'll, then we'll create that block we'll mine that one and add that one to the blockchain and of course that will perform all those checks right so let's implement that example come over to our main file and there's going to be just a ton of errors here because when well, we actually could change this constructor here I don't think we need that anymore this guy is going to be a vector of transactions here and I'm going to rename this guy to Genesis block cool okay so we'll put transactions in here transaction transaction cool transaction has inputs in this case it's an empty vector because it's a coinbase transaction and outputs so I'm gonna send some coins to Alice and some to Bob so I'm going to say uh, transaction output create one here it'll be uh, value of 50 and to address is Alice Alice dot two owned okay and then we'll create one for Bob to Bob and Bob gets seven measly coins okay this is gonna yell at me because it doesn't know what transaction is so we have to come over to our lib.rs file Doo -doo -doo. make this guy public like so now stop yelling at me yay okay so then we'll mine our genesis block sweet that looks like it should work that looks like it should work this guy doesn't work so we'll say let mutt blockchain equal blockchain and new i don't think that exists yet 
So we'll go have to make a blockchain new function right over here, pub fn new. And that'll just make a blockchain for us. It'll be so much nicer than having to write it all out ourselves. So we'll say blocks is just a vector, an empty, empty vector. And unspent, unspent out, outputs. Don't use an equal sign there. A hash set new, just like that. All right. So now this guy should work. Yay. And we don't have this verify thing anymore. Instead, uh, we have blockchain.update with block. And we'll say genesis block. I did call it that, right? Yeah, update with block. Okay, cool. Now we'll just delete all this code here because we don't need that. We don't need that anymore. Cool, cool. And um, this is going to yell at me because it wants us to use the result value. So it says unused result must be used. Basically, to use it, we just have to say, look, if it's OK, do this. If it's an error, do this. Basically, handle both cases. We can do that by asserting that it will work, otherwise panic. And the name of the function that does that for us is expect, because it's expecting it to be OK. Otherwise, leave with this message in this string, and that will be failed to add a genesis block. This is also going to yell at us because it doesn't know how to print the error message because we need to implement a specific debug trait for our uh, for our block validation error struct enum thing. Um, luckily, we can have the compiler do it mostly for us. Uh, this just allows it, it just ensures that when it prints out the error, it knows what to print. So here, we can have the compiler derive this debug trait. There are only a few traits that can be derived. Uh, this one can be derived. And what happens is then when you print it out in debug formatting, it just says, all right, a mismatch index. OK, I'll print literally this. I'll print literally invalid hash. I'll print literally invalid input or whatever. So that's all it does. Now it'll be happy with us. And I'll open up our terminal, say cargo run. Cross our fingers, hope it works. And it looks like it does. And that was, wow, that's a really small knot. OK, so cool. This works. What happens if we make an invalid Coinbase transaction? So I'll just like copy a random output here and say the to address is like Chris. Chris. OK, run. Will it yell at us? Yes. So here it says thread main panicked. There's a panic for us. And it just like crashed our program, right? It says failed to add Genesis block invalid Coinbase transaction. Because that is an invalid Coinbase transaction. How intelligent of our blockchain to know that. All right. So we've added our Genesis block. Now let's add another block to our blockchain. So I'm going to copy this whole dealio. Yep. And there we go. OK, so we won't call it Genesis block. This guy will just be block. And OK, block, block. This guy, nope. And I don't need a new blockchain. OK, uh, this is not a Genesis block. Uh, ah. And neither is that. OK, so now let's update our uh, transactions that are going on here. So this one will be another Coinbase transaction. We'll just send this to Chris and give him like 536 coins for no reason, except he mined the block. So yay, good job, Chris. Um, now, here, since we are just these are only identified by hashes. I could literally just copy this guy into here, and we know what, it, and our blockchain would know what it was. Um, I'm going to reference it in a different way, and instead say um, block 
blockchain uh, blockchain blocks zero transactions zero uh, outputs zero clone to create a copy of it it will have the same hash because it contains the same data it's just a clone also clone doesn't exist yet luckily we can have the compiler do that for us no method name clone on output so we'll go over to this guy and say derive clone basically whoops you can have the compiler derive clone if all the members of your struct also are clonable so strings are clonable unsigned 64-bit integers are clonable therefore this struct is clonable cool compiler now knows that and over here we can clone it cool and now we can set up some outputs so this one will be to Alice okay so this this particular output is this one right here so they're 50 coins remember in our example Alice has 50 coins sends those 50 coins into the transaction sends some back to herself and some to Bob so that's what we're gonna do we'll have Alice so we have 50 coins input Alice is gonna send 36 back to herself and then Bob is going to receive 12 coins so we'll have a two coin fee sweet now let's see that is not going to work actually because we need to update this to say last hash and this index is one all right so let's test that out please work crossing our fingers yes it worked cool now let's try and hit some of our points of failure so for example if i use as input a transaction that doesn't exist like we're inputting absurd amounts of coins from nobody so this uh, this output does not exist so then we should get an invalid output failure and it says invalid output lovely and now we're only inputting 50 coins but Alice wants to send herself 360 now what happens it says insufficient input value which is exactly what we wanted and that concludes the coding portion of this video because it works yay but there's more some just quickie notes about the security obviously this is super duper not secure when we get to smart contracts which should be one of the next couple videos uh we should fix or have a idea of what fixing this would look like for each of these first four bullet points here because um, the difficulty stored in block is not validated we're just trusting that um, the value of the coinbase transaction is not validated very much it's just ensured that it's higher than the fee to make sure that miners accepting the fee but we have no concept of like all right so the block reward for these blocks should be 12 and a half bitcoins or 12 and a half coins whatever uh, we don't have concept of that because well we don't have a network we don't have a lot of stuff we don't have a lot of infrastructure infrastructure in this project um, and then coin ownership is neither enforced nor existent because that's not really a thing yet we'll get to that in smart contracts and then obviously this is the biggest and most obvious one two otherwise identical outputs from different transactions are indistinguishable because the only identifying pieces of information on an output are who it's to and how much it's for so if if david sends chris two coins and alice sends chris two coins those two outputs are indistinguishable and so that would create major problems but we'll fix that when we get to smart contracts and that is the end of this video i hope you enjoyed it it was obviously a lot of coding and uh yeah so hope you enjoyed it um hope you learned something my name is jacob uh don't forget to subscribe do all the other things that the popular youtubers of today say that you ought to do at the end of videos but unfortunately i am not an expert youtuber i apologize for that so until next time uh it's been fun my name's Jacob, and have a good one.